hands this morning as we reflect um, on the week, the week leading up to the cross. We're just so thankful, Father, for your sacrifice, for your gift to us, Lord.
To the Lord, to the Lord. 
Father, we exalt you this morning. We say thank you for the gift of your son. As today we are reminded of the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ, we also know what's coming down the line, which is a brutal, brutal death. But we also know after that, that's not where the story ends, but there's a resurrection coming and there is life that is coming and there is healing and there is forgiveness and there's life and eternal life that we get to spend with God in heaven. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that what those palms represent, they represent a victory that is coming, Lord, that no matter what it looks like on Friday, that there is another day coming, and that day is filled with hope and with joy and with healing. So Father God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that plan, Lord. And so today we just give it all to you, Lord. We say, do what you will, Lord. We say, thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing, for all that you're doing for all of us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, church. Let's worship for the resurrection life that is coming today. Well, welcome, church. We are so excited to be spending this Palm Sunday with you, I say, Turn to a neighbor, say hi, greet them as we're starting to transition. 
try to find somebody you haven't met before. Give them a big welcome. I know I've been seeing some new faces this morning, which is always amazing. always amazing. We're so happy when you decide to come here and spend your Sunday with us. So in the back of the seat pocket, you will find a connect card. And I want to encourage you to fill that out. We want to get to know you. We want to have you involved in the church to know what's going on, what's coming up. Summertime's coming. We do some picnics. They're a lot, a lot of fun to get connected with other people in the church. So you can fill that out. And when we do our tithes and offerings, you can drop that in the bucket or you can go to the connect corner. I suggest doing that one because then you get a free coffee and amen for that on a Sunday morning. So <laughs> fill that out, bring it to the connect corner after church and we would be so happy to get bless you with a coffee. Another note to add is that we have our little fireplace going in the lobby for moms, dads, aunts, uncles who need. You got a little squirmy kiddo. We have that outside for you. Service will be streaming on the TV above the fireplace. And we would just love that for you to use that if you need to. So I'm going to transition into tithes and offerings. So I will welcome our ushers up to the front. Again, in the seat back pocket, you will find one of these envelopes if you're still using that these days. If you're not like me, use the app. So we have the Church Center app where you can give. You can give online through the website. So I will pray for that quickly. Father God, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you that this is another time of worship, another time where we can put our faith and trust in you, where we can just give and sow into your house, into the ministries of this house, Lord God, to know that you can put this money further, bring it to the right hands, Lord God. I pray that you bless it, you bless the houses that it comes from, Lord God, that as they give, it will be given back to them, Lord. And so we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, last little bit. Easter is next week, amen. We're so, so excited for Easter. Friday, we actually are having a Good Friday service, so you're invited on the table when you leave the sanctuary is the word that I'm looking for when you leave the sanctuary. Thank you, Jim. On the table, there will be invites, and I'm going to challenge every single one of you. Grab one of these invites, pray over it, ask the Lord to tell you who to invite to church next Sunday, to come to church on Friday. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be the best time ever. And speaking of Good Friday, Easter, after that, so April 7th, we are having child dedications and baptisms, which is amazing, woo, for that. So after church today, we are actually having a baptism class to kind of go over what we're doing, the confession we're making with that. If you have any questions, those will all be answered. So after church, baptism class, and I think that's all I got for you. So without further ado, I will call up Pastor Malachi. He's preaching the word today, so we can stand up and welcome him. out. Thank you, Ben. Hey, give it up for the worship team. They are awesome. So good this morning. Well, I'm excited to get into today. My name is uh, Malachi. I'm the youth pastor here at KCC. If you don't know me, I know there's some faces that I did not recognize today. So if you're new, hello. Nice to meet you. That's good to be here. Uh, I hope you're ready for the word of God today. You guys ready? Awesome, because we're going we're gonna to pretty much jump right in um, how many of you have been enjoying uh, this last series of I Am? We've been going through the book of John, and uh, I think the book of John is so, so important. And I, I mean, every book of the Bible is important, but to understand what we're talking about, and uh, 
I was just thinking about the book of John and how the theme is, and we're kind of going through these I am statements, but the theme of the book of John is, is really cool because the author, he's bringing us to a conclusion, right? As we read the book of John, the, the author is trying to get us to decide something. And, and through these I am statements that Jesus makes, I think it's really important for us to understand why he's saying these I am statements. And I think that we can talk about, you know, what Jesus did and what Jesus does. And I think we get fixated on what Jesus can do and, and sometimes maybe even what he can do for us. And we, we sometimes forget to, to remind ourselves of who Jesus is, right? We, we remind ourselves of who he is. And, and the book of John is, is really asking us and, and almost causing us to make a decision and to make up our mind about who Jesus is. It's, it's causing us to, to ask the question, you know, was Jesus who he said he was? Was he a liar or was he actually God? And it causes us, it brings us to a, a conclusion. It's not a, it's not a, oh, maybe God is this or maybe Jesus is this. It's, it's either Jesus is who he says he was or he wasn't, right? And it, and it causes us to, to begin to ask ourselves that question and, and actually decide. Because the important thing about this is when we actually know who he is, and not just what he does, you'll believe who he is, then you'll actually trust him, right? It's like, who can say that they would trust a stranger? Nobody. We teach our kids, right? Stranger danger. Stay away. You see somebody you don't know, don't talk to them. They're weird, right? Like, but when we actually know Christ, when we know who he is, we'll trust him and we'll, we'll rely upon him. And he's, and he's not just someone that could do something for us, but he's, he becomes everything for us, right? It's a difference. And so I want to I wanna jump into this passage of scripture this morning uh, in John 15. And so I think we have it on the screen. John 15, 1 to 17. And I'm going to just read through this, and we're going to break this down uh, this morning. So it says, this is Jesus talking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Everyone say, more fruit. You are already clean. Because of the word which I have spoken to you, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. It's comforting, right? <laughs> if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask what you desire and it shall be done. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Verse nine says, as the father has loved me, I have also loved you and abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his. These are the things that I've spoken to you that my joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Everyone say, joy may be full. Who wants their joy full this morning? Amen. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay one's life down for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends for all the things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus chose you. Amen? That's a beautiful truth. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So he comes back to that initial starting point and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask in the ask the father in my name he will give to you these things i command that you love one another let's pray this morning father god i thank you for your word god that we are lost without it 
God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, we are empty without you. We thank you that this morning that you are here today. Your presence is here, that you're here with us. And God, we want to lean into your love today. We want to lean into your words today. God, would you change us, adjust our hearts today. God, let us be soft this morning that we can hear what you have to say to us. God, we believe that you speak to everybody. God, you speak today. You're not a dead God. You're not a silent God. But you speak today, and they're speaking to each and every person in here this morning. God, we want to just rely upon you today. Cause us to grow in a deeper relationship with you and each other. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you agree, somebody say amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. We love Michael. I told him I wouldn't gas him up and make him embarrassed, but I can't help it. He's just too awesome. (laughs) He's too humble. Um, I want to... I want to jump into uh, what Jesus is talking to, talking about right away, um, because there's there's a lot to kind of unpack in this in this scripture. And so, as we read John and we read John 15, we see that Jesus he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his disciples at the the Last Supper. So if you've ever wondered what the conversation was at the Last Supper, it's basically like John 12, 13, 14, and 15. It's a very long conversation. And, and, he's, and he's, he's downloading, he's giving his disciples a lot to chew on. And, uh, and Jesus says this statement. He says, I am the true vine. Everyone say that with me, the true vine. And obviously, obviously this is a metaphor. Uh, you know, Jesus loved to speak in parables and kind of give metaphors. And, and you can, you know, obviously for us kind of reading this, we can see that it would make sense. Obviously, they, you know, there was orchards, there's vineyards at this time, and they would know how to plant, and they would know how to farm, they would know kind of the idea of what this meant. But there was also this a deeper meaning to this statement. It wasn't just a metaphor about the, the, the vines and the fruit and, you know, bear fruit and, like, we get that. It's super plain and simple. But there is a statement that I think it weighs so much heavier. And if you were in the room with the disciples, as he said, I am the true vine, their, draw, their jaws would have dropped. There would have been something different. And, and the vine in the Old Testament, whenever that term, the vine, was used, it was, it was often referred to the people of Israel. Right? It was, it was uh, the term for God's people in Psalm 80, uh, 8 to 9. It says, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have, you have cast out nations and planted it. You have prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and fill the land. So, like, this, this was that, you know, God calling Israel out of Egypt. He's, 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 it's referring to the people of Israel, the vine. And, and the other part of this is most of the time, the, you, they would use this term in a negative way, right? And so Jeremiah 2.21, it says, Yet I have planted you a noble vine, again, talking about the people of Israel, a seed of the highest quality. How then have you turned from me into a degenerate plant? Right? So it's like, it's this rebuke that happens. And oftentimes, there's, there's multiple uh, points of the scripture where it talks about the vine that's not producing fruit. The vine that keeps messing up. And we all know the story of, of Israel and, and how many, like if you read through the New Testament, like the ups and downs that Israel goes through. Where they, they, they follow God and they're, they're all in and then they sin and then they turn from God and they, they turn to other gods and God brings judgment and God brings correction. And then they turn back to God and they kind of go through this cycle all throughout the Old Testament. And it's, and it's, and it's referring to the vine that's just... The, that can't uphold the law, the vine that, that can't do it on its own, right? And, and Jesus says, I am the true vine. They would have been like mind blown in this moment because Jesus is actually flipping the script. You, you with me on that? He's flipping the script. He says, I am the true vine. I am doing what you can't do. I am the one who can, you can't be. I, am be. I am doing what you can't do. I am fulfilling the law that you can't uphold, right? He, and it's, it's that picture of, of him just coming in and saying, hey, you can rely on me. I am the true vine. I am the source. I am the answer to the problem. 
right? There's no amount of good works that you can do to, to, to gain righteousness. You have to rely on me, right? And it's, and it's kind of this beautiful picture. He's saying that I am the new, I'm the new vine, right? I'm the new picture of this where you can, you can look to me, right? And, and, and actually, it's a, it does this other thing where I'm sure that, you know, as the disciples, they were, they were Jewish, and, and they, would, they would have known that kind of failure of their people, right? It kind of hangs over the people of Israel where they just they couldn't uphold the law. They just could, they would just, they have this really tainted history. And so Jesus saying that is bringing hope over that history, right? And so, again, he's saying, I am the vine. I'm the one that's going to bring hope. I am the source. And so there's, there's three things in this passage that I want to, I want to, I want to bring up. And the first is this, if, if Jesus is the true vine and the father is the vine dresser, we can expect pruning, right? And that and it kind of sucks, right? Like if, if you've ever, you know, you know anything about gardening, like obviously like to be pruned is, it's not fun. It's not comfortable. Um, but for us as Christians, we are called to bear fruit. To be a Christian is to bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, then there's something missing. If you don't bear fruit, there's a connection error Right? Anyone remember dial-up when it took like 18 years to get on the internet? Like, and it just didn't work? Like, there's a, there's, a, there's a distortion. There's a distance. There's something not right. If you're a Christian, you're called to bear fruit. And so it, it, it says, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. If we aren't connected to Jesus, we will not bear fruit. If we're connected to Jesus, well, what? Bear fruit, right? Simple. How do you, so how do you define what fruit is? I think, I think this is a kind of a harder topic in today's age because, you know, we, we, often, we often think fruit equals success in our life, right? If I'm, you know, if I'm successful, then I'm bearing fruit, right? If I'm popular, oh, I'm bearing fruit. If I have, you know, lots of money in my, in my bank account, oh, I'm, I'm fruitful, right? And we often, we often, think that way, but I think that it's completely different, and, and it's much simpler than that. It's in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's the fruit we bear. The fruit of the Spirit is this. Everyone say it with me. You guys know it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who got all nine? <laughs> Bible scholars. <laughs> but right, like, I think, I think in context of this, too, like, we can look at this and be like, you know, we're not all killing it in the, in the Galatians 5.22, right? We're, w- there's probably some things in there that you were probably like, well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to work on my patience. I'm trying to work on my kindness. You know, I missed it the other day. I wasn't loving towards my wife. Or I, I, I yelled at my kids. And we, we're not all doing, like, perfectly in this, in this avenue. Would we all agree in that? Right? But... But that's why Jesus has to come and prune us, right? And it's, and it's not us producing the fruit. We don't produce that. It's the fruit of the what? The spirit, right? We talked about this a few, a few weeks ago. When we're spirit-led, we'll see the fruit, right? And it's the same thing. When we abide in Jesus and we're connected to Jesus, we'll see the fruit. But it's not us that's causing the fruit to grow. It has nothing to do with me. Right, again, going back to Jesus is the true vine. Jesus is the source. And he has to prune out, he has to clear out those things that we add. Right? Because you might have, you might be loving towards someone, but you have a little bit of selfish ambition in there. And God needs to come and prune that out. And it's not so that he can chastise you and, and hurt you and, and make you feel bad. Right? There's this quote, I don't know who it was, but it's, it's painful to bleed, but it's worse to wither. It's painful to bleed, but it's worse to wither. Right? Jesus prunes us, and we bear more. We bear better fruit. Right? We need to be pruned. Um, 
we, uh, we, me and my wife just bought a, a house in the summer, and it came with uh, some fruit trees, which was cool at first, <laughs> until you understand how much work fruit trees take. Like, for myself, my experience of plants is most of the plants that I've ever been in contact with have died. So that's my track record. And, uh, and so we, we see, like, we have these fruit trees, and I'm like, how do you take care of fruit trees? I remember, like, the first week that we, we had our house, we had our, our youth group over. There was, like, 60 kids in the backyard. We were watching a movie, and I felt so bad for our neighbors. Um, they were like, yeah, great. We love the new people. This is awesome. This is how it's going to be, right? But, uh, but I, I was talking to one of the parents because he actually works here. He's an awesome friend of mine, and, and he knows a lot about, like, trees, and he used to do gardening and all that stuff. And so he's, the first thing he says to me is, like, that's a big pear tree. I'm like, oh, Yeah. I don't know how big they're supposed to be. And it's like, I guess it's a, is that a normal pear tree? He's like, no, it's way overgrown. Like they haven't, they haven't taken care of it. And I'm like, oh, great. And it literally was so tall that it was almost touching the power lines. And so he's like, well, you're going to have to deal with that. I'm like, I don't have a ladder. Like, <laughs> I don't know. How am I going to get up to this tree? So, so anyways, so, so, so I crashed it all summer. I didn't want to deal with it. And fall comes and there's pears like, by the bunches coming off this tree. Like, it's producing some fruit. And my wife loved pears. I don't like pears. My first instance was, like, let's just cut the tree down, right? We don't need this tree. And the, but the worst part of this tree is, is it's not only overgrown. It's not only, like, like never been kept. And, and it, it's also on this kind of awkward hill. Like, our driveway is kind of a steep, long hill. And in this, this pear tree is kind of in the middle of it in this weird spot. So you can't even get a ladder up there. So I understand why they didn't take care of it. It would have been a nightmare. And so I'm procrastinating, procrastinating. And these, these pears are falling all over our driveway. They're rolling down the hill. People are driving over the pears. Right, Rebecca? You remember this? This is embarrassing. Like, <laughs> one day there was this guy that, like, walked up to the pear trees, started picking fruit off of it, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> anyways, um, my dog was barking, I was yelling, but I was, I was Christian that day, okay? But, uh, so me and my wife, we decided, okay, we gotta get some of these pears, like, we gotta stop wasting the fruit, right? We're, we're out there with bins and bags, and we're carrying all this fruit into the garage, and like, what are we supposed to do with all these pears? I hate pears. You're not gonna eat that many pears. How do we give these pears away? And so we're like, we're, we're stressing out, like, how do we fix this pear tree? And so I was procrastinating, procrastinating, and watching these pears just fall all over our driveway every time the wind blew. It was like hundreds, like, I'm not kidding you. There were so many pears. Okay, this, this summer, if you want some pears, come to my place, please. Please, for the love of God, take our pears and help me cut down this tree. Aaron, I need to borrow your chainsaw this summer, okay? That's our summer project. We'll replant it, don't worry. But so I'm standing there, I'm looking at this pear I'm like, finally, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm so fed up with this pear tree. I get out there and I have a reciprocating saw, because that's all I had at the time. And, I'm cl- and I start climbing this tree because... Like, the, the pears are not only just falling on the road, but they're falling on our renter's truck. And so it's, like, it's becoming a liability. I'm like, if small children walk by, they're going to get knocked out because they're big pears, right? And so I'm, I climb this tree, and Rebecca stayed inside because she was completely embarrassed because there's people driving by. And I'm, like, eight feet up in this tree, shaking it, like... I'm, like, violently shaking the pears out of the tree, and, like, I'm, I'm cut, I'm bleeding, I'm getting hit in the head by pears, like, and there's, and I kid you not, there's hundreds and hundreds of pears just all over the road, and we're, I'm, I'm out there with a shovel after, like, like, scooping up just squished pears, because there's nothing I can do, because people just keep driving, and pears keep falling, I'm cutting off branches, I'm like, I'm hacking away, like, if you've seen the tree before, it was really pretty, and now it's, it's really ugly, because I did a terrible job, I don't know how to prune trees, I say all this to say this, <laughs> it's a long story, but we're getting to the point, okay, I don't like pears, that's what I'm saying, no, I'm kidding, but this, this pear tree, so, so this is the other side. So you can, you can be a Christian, right, and, and, and we're called to bear fruit. But if we are not bearing fruit, there's something wrong. But there's also, a, there's also a flip side to this where you might bear fruit, but you could be overgrown. And the fruit just gets wasted. Right? And so regardless, regardless the, the importance of the pruning remains, Right? 
And so the, 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 this pear tree was like, it was producing fruit, and it was like a lot of pears. But a, like I would say 50% of them, 70% of them were wasted, right? And now you might be like, you're just lazy, you didn't want to go out and get them. But like, but it's, it's the fact of the matter that that tree needed to be pruned. It needed to be kept. It needed to be tended to. Just as we do, we need to allow God to tend to us. We need to allow God to trim off those parts. Even if it's like, God, I'm producing fruit. Don't like cut off my branch. Like don't, no, don't do that. Like there's parts of us that we want to keep and that we, we hold on to, right? But God's like, hey, I want to I wanna take that off so I can actually, you can bear fruit in a better way and your fruit won't be wasted, right? And so again, if we bear fruit, it's, it's good, but we need to be pruned. If we're not, we're missing something. So God needs to prune us. And we need to be available to him. We need to be willing to be pruned by him. And it's a hard truth. I need God to, to have established discipline in my life. Right? I need hard lines drawn in my life. I need to be corrected. Right? I need God's word to come in and purge my soul. Daily. It's, it's actually really cool that the word prune in this, in this passage, it also means to cleanse. And so when we, when we think about God's word, it's, it's a passage in Ephesians that, that talks about the word of God cleanses our soul. It cleanses our spirit. It cleanses our mind, right? The, the word of God is, is what prunes us. And so if we, if we avoid the Bible and we avoid reading and we avoid God's word in our life, we're going to become overgrown. And it's going to be wasted. So we can expect pruning and we have to, we have to accept the pruning. Amen? Expect pruning, accept the pruning. And number two is our position in Christ. So Jesus, he states this in verse three. He says, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken. Already you are pruned because of the word I have spoken. Already you are cleansed because of the word I have spoken. And so he's, again, he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to them saying, hey, you have, your, your pruning process has already started. Your sanctification has already start, started because of the, you believed the words I've told you. They accepted the words that I've told you, they have received his word already, right? So he, like going through, like they, they, they accepted that he's the son of God. They accept, maybe they didn't fully understand it, but they're accepting his word and he's, he's telling them, hey, you are clean because you are accepting the words. You're believing my word. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. And they started to take that in. They started to take the words of Jesus and start to believe it for themselves, and so the work of the pruning and the cleansing in the disciples had already begun. And it's, and it's so funny because, you know, Jesus says this, hey, you are clean because of the words I've spoken to you and you believed. But then skip 24 hours and they've all abandoned him. And they've run off and they've completely denied even knowing Jesus. And Jesus knew this was going to happen, right? Our position in, in Christ is not because of who I am. My position in Christ is not because of what I've done. My position in Christ is not what I can do, but it's because who he is. It's because of who he is. And I think we wrestle with that idea of righteousness. We wrestle with that idea of, of, of Christ imputing righteousness on us. And it's not, it's not a righteousness of our own, right? I can't become righteous on my good works. I can't become righteous on, on doing good things in the world. I can't buy my salvation, right? You, we all know this, right? And, but we struggle with it. We struggle with it because Christ was perfect, and he gives us our, his righteousness. We're, so we're, in God's view, we are, we are as like Jesus, which is really hard for us to wrestle with because of our human nature. When we, when we mess up, what do we do, right? Pastor Brian talked about this last week where we, like, we're like sheep. We're kind of not stupid sometimes. What was the word? Like, we're, we're, we're forgetting, we're forgetful. We, we drift. If we don't have a shepherd in our life, we're, we're wandering. 
And especially if we, if we offend, like if you offend someone, do you want to immediately go and talk to them? No. You want to avoid them at all costs, right? Most of us, we, 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 we distance ourselves when we offend someone. We distance ourselves when we, when we mess up, right? We don't, we don't like confrontation. We don't like to be corrected. And so for us, we, a lot of us, we have this idea that we have to come clean before we get to God. But it's actually the opposite. Jesus says, come to me and I'll make you whole. Come to me and I'll make you clean. Come to me and I'll, and I'll make you righteous. Come to me and, I'll, and I offer forgiveness. It's not like, God, I have to, you know, I'm standing on the outside of the house and I'm going to make everything right before I come to you. That's, that's the opposite of what happens. And, and, and it's really interesting. There's a, like, like I said, 24 hours after this statement, we see Peter. Right? And Peter's sitting down at the, the Last Supper, and he's sitting down with Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, you're going to betray me. You're going to betray me three times. And, G- and Peter's like, Peter's fired up. He's like, no way. I would die before I betray you. And he argue, he's a, he's the audacity to argue with Jesus in this moment. Like, he's like, I would die before I betray you. And we fast forward to the garden, and, and Peter tries to prove it. He tries to prove his worth. He tries to prove his goodness and his, and his faithfulness to Jesus where, where Jesus is getting arrested and, and Peter pulls out a sword. He's ready to kill somebody, right? And he cuts a guy's ear off. I don't know if he just missed or like, I don't know how you just cut the ear off anyways. But Jesus, he, he rebukes Peter. Those that live by the sword die by the sword and he, he picks up the ear and heals it. He puts it back on the dude's face. Not his face. It's out of his head. Anatomy, right? It's so bad. But then after this, right, like, like everybody flees. Everybody runs away. And Jesus is taken off. And he's taken to court. He's taken to be judged. And here's Peter hiding in the crowd, kind of like he's got a hood over his head. He doesn't want to be seen. Right? He feels embarrassed. Man, I shouldn't have cut that guy's ear off. That was stupid, Peter, right? Like, he's probably talking to himself. Probably, he's frustrated, right? But he's, he's following at a distance. Notice there's, there's distance between him and Jesus. He's kind of like, he's kind of pulling back a little bit. Like, okay, I'm, I'm here, but I'm not really here. And then these people around, they start to recognize Peter. Hey, weren't you that guy? I noticed your accent. Hey, weren't you, aren't you with the, this Jesus guy? Oh, no, no, no. I don't know him. Don't know who he is. Never seen him before. Leave me alone. Three times this happens. And on the third time, Peter's like, he's fed up with being asked. He's like, he curses out the person. And at that moment, there's the rooster crows. And, and it actually says that Jesus turns and looks at Peter. And they, they, they see each other. And what does Peter do? He runs away. He's, he's, he's broken. He's, he feels as if he's like betrayed his best friend, his mentor. And he runs away. He does what most of us do when we mess up. We put distance between us and God because we feel terrible, right? We feel disqualified. We feel like, man, I've just messed it up. I can't be in the presence of God. I failed. And so fast forward to post-resurrection. We see the disciples They've gone back to what they knew, right? They didn't know what to do. Jesus is like, Jesus is gone. We don't know what to do. So we're going to go back to what we know. And they're, they're fishing and they're in the boat and they're at, it's at night and they're not catching anything and they're down. They're feeling probably really frustrated and lost. And Jesus shows up on the shoreline. They don't recognize him at first. And he says, hey, cast your net on the other side. You'll catch some fish. And, it, and, it, and immediately when they pull up the fish, it dawns on Peter because that's the first way that Jesus met him. Isn't this so cool that Jesus would come and he would meet Peter in a, in a way that was recognizable when he was lost. He meets him back when he first met him in a boat struggling to find fish. And immediately they, they all understand it's Jesus and they start turning the boat. But what does Peter do? He doesn't wait. He, it's crazy. He actually just t- like ties his, his robe up and he jumps in the water and he moves as fast as he can towards Jesus. 
And this is, this is what our response should be when we fail. Because who's failed this week? Man, who's failed this month? Who's failed this year? Who's failed today? Man, I am going to fail. I'm going to fail. It's, an, it's inevitable. But, but my response needs to be running to Jesus, not away from him. Right? And, and, and it's when you, and this is why this is important, because it's when you understand your position in Christ, it means you don't have to run away. Right? And if, if you don't understand your position in Christ, you will want to run away because you're, you're in fear. But when you understand that there's no condemnation, and, it, and this, isn't, this isn't a, this isn't a, a ticket to, to you know, a, a fast pass or a free pass to sin and do whatever you want and just abuse grace. But you don't have to run away from the presence of God anytime you mess up. You run into it. You run in too closer to him. Right? It's when you know your position. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of Christ. When you believe the words of Jesus, when you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you are saved, and you, are, you, you, you take on, he gives it to you, his righteousness. And you don't have to feel like you have to earn it. Stop trying to earn the righteousness. You accept it, and, you, and anytime you mess up, you, you run to him. Because again, like Pastor Brian talked about last week, when, there's, when we put distance, it's like there's this distortion that comes, and lies come in, and, 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 and it tries to twist our view of who God really is. It tries to twist our view into thinking like, oh, God hates me, and God, oh, man, he can never forgive me, and man, I'm just such a screw up, and, and I'm the only one that's dealing with this, and I'm the, I'm the biggest failure, and that's, and that's the lies that come in when we have distance. But when we're close to him, we can actually hear his voice because the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd, right? When you're close to him, you can, you can recognize the truth, you can recognize the word of God, and, and, it's, and, and you're going to get fed lies all day long, but it's when you're close to the truth, you're going to know when it's a lie. Amen? Third thing, and I'm going to invite the, the team to come up. The third thing that Jesus is talking about in this passage of scripture is love to obey. Love to obey. It says in verse 9, as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And just as I have kept the Father's commandments, I abide in his love. These things have been spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and my joy and your joy may be full. And I, I, think that, I think that a lot of us get this one backwards. Where we think that we have to obey to become approved. We have to do just to check off the box in order to become approved by God. And it's actually the opposite. We don't, we don't do to love. We won't be able to fake it till we make it because I think it quickly becomes legalism for us. Or we're just doing things out of ritual. And not that ritual is bad. Not that tradition is bad. But when, it be, when your heart is absent from the doing, it's, it's like, it's, it's garbage. It doesn't, it doesn't translate. It doesn't mean anything. It's just this legalistic view that we get. And again, we just fall back into trying to earn and trying to, trying to say, God, look at me, look at me. I'm doing things. I'm doing things for your kingdom. But when our heart is absent, from the doing, man, it's worthless. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey. Pastor Dave, um, he, he, he taught a master class this week. Um, and he said this statement that I, I had to write down because it's, it's this, it's the greatest expression of love is obedience. And this is, again, this is not an obligant obedience. This is a willing obedience. And it only becomes willing obedience when we love, right? 
my motivation to obey Jesus has to be out of love for Christ. If I don't love Jesus, why would I obey him? Right? And it's, and it's in the same, if you're married here, like you can, especially if you've been married for a long time, you know, you know, husbands, you know, if you buy your wife flowers, she's going to be pumped. Right? She'll be happy. And, and you can easily manipulate that. You could be doing something stupid and be like, oh, I'm just going to buy her flowers to make this better. Right? And on the flip side, if I love my wife, man, I know what she loves. And, and my motivation is to, I'm not just going to buy her flowers to make her feel better. I'm going to buy her, because, buy her flowers because I love her. Right? There's a difference between just manipulation and actual motivation of the heart. Right? And that's going to grow my marriage because she's going she's gonna to see that I actually care. Or, or a simple one, when you, when you do the dishes without being asked, <laughs> you ever have like the beams of light come off your wife? She's so happy. Or, or when the house is clean and she gets home from like a long day of, of whatever she was doing, maybe she was shopping, right? I don't know. That's, that's totally sexist. Not going to say that, but... Right? When, but when I do stuff out of a different motivation, it means so much more. And it's the same thing with God, right? He, he, he doesn't want us to become little robots and just kind of go, ah, 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 yes, Lord. Like, no. He loves his creation. And he wants you to be a part of it. He wants you to abide in his love. Abide in him. Stay close to the vine. And, and, and when, when obedience is, is happening, it's not a chore for me because I love to do it. It's something that I know pleases God. And I know it's, it's something that actually instills more love for God in my life. My motivation needs to be love. And in turn, when I'm obeying, I'm abiding. And it's this kind of cycle that we, we go in and, and my love increases and my obedience increases and I, and I continue to abide and, and God prunes away the, the things that don't need to be there and I continue to grow and I can grow more and it's, and it's more and more each time I, I get corrected or, or there's adjustments in my life and I read the word and I'm like, man, that hurts, but it's so good for me. And that's, that's our Christian walk. It's this constant, like we're, we're constantly adjusting, Right? It's these micro adjust, uh, adjustments that we need to make and we need to be open to the Holy Spirit coming in with his word and changing those little things in our hearts, right? And maybe today, maybe you're feeling that. Maybe you're feeling like you're feeling the Holy Spirit say, hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna change that in you. I wanna change that response that you had today. I wanna change those little things that, that you're, you're really not happy with. Right, and I actually feel like the Holy Spirit is is saying to us today, man, I wanna I wanna make those little micro adjustments, but you just gotta just obey and open up your heart. It's draw close to me. Draw close to me. We are we are also called to grow in our love for Christ. I need to fill my life with things that bring affection to Him. Amen. Well, I have to I have to start thinking what stirs my affection for Jesus? And take an account of of what you do week to week. Because if 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 we're not stirring our affection for Jesus, man, he's not going to do it for you. Right? We need to stir our affection and so so what are those things that stir our affection? Because when I, when I stir my affection for God and I, and I, I, I grow in my love for him, the, it's, it's the more I want to obey and the more my path becomes straight. And it's very practical. Like, pay, pay attention to what stirs your love for Jesus. And maybe this morning was one of those things where you came into church and, and, and the worship was playing and you're next to other believers and it, and it stirs your affection. It stirs your, your, your love for God. It reminds you who he is. And maybe it's, maybe it's just prayer alone at home. 
where it stirs your affection. His word daily will stir your affection. Spending time with people that love Jesus will stir your affection. Spending time talking with people about Jesus will stir your affection. And at the same time, we have to, we have to know what robs us of that affection. We have to ask that question, what's robbing me of spending time with Jesus? What am I putting in place of spending time with Jesus? What am I putting in my life? What am I filling my life with that's robbing me? What is my intake? What am I watching on TV? Not, not saying that TV is bad. Don't throw your TV in the garbage. Maybe some of you might have to, right? I, old youth pastor stories where we burn CDs. Remember doing that? There's like all the bad CDs that you had and we all like a bonfire. Like maybe that's something you have to do where you're like, there's something actually hindering your walk with Christ and you have to physically take it and throw it away. But what what is the intake? What am I daily taking in? And is it stirring my affection or is it robbing of my affection? Am I, who am I surrounding myself with? People that love Jesus or people that curse his name. And that affects us because who you're around is, is who you will become if you, if you allow it to, to, if you don't challenge those things. I'm not saying don't ever be around a non-Christian. I'm saying if those are your closest friends and those are who you draw advice from and those are the people that you surround yourself with and those are the people that you go to when you're in trouble and those are the people that you are constantly like drawing from, man, it's going to affect you. And in turn, if you're around people that are drawing off the same source, it's going to stir your affection. Can I pray for you this morning? Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes? Jesus is the true vine. And we have to really wrestle with that and get that in our hope, in our spirit. Get that in your mind. He is the source of my life. He is the source of my joy. He is the source of my peace. He is the source of everything in my life. God, we want to stay connected to you. We want to stay connected to the vine. Cause us to bear fruit, Father. Cause us to be open to your pruning, to your cleansing. Father, remind us of our position in you. God, remind us daily as we're forgetful, we get distracted, we fill our minds with fruitless things. Father, we just Remind us today of our position in you, God, that we, we don't have to earn it, but God, we just fall into who you are. We believe the things you said, God. Even as we were talking at the beginning, we believe that you are who you said you were, that you are the Son of God. You are the bread of life. You are the light of the world. You're the good shepherd. You are the true vine. You're the resurrection and the life. And God, we fully accept you into our hearts. God, we accept you into our lives. We accept that truth. We believe that truth. And God, cause us to really evaluate what we do on the daily and to ask ourselves, is that gonna cause my affection to stir? Is that gonna grow my love for you? Or is, is that gonna rob me of my love for you? I God, will we take an inventory this week, today, to start making those adjustments by your Holy Spirit, God, would you speak to us to help us make those adjustments that, that you want to make, that pruning, that cleansing, God. Take out the things that don't need to be there. 
Jesus' name. I just want to invite you to just keep your eyes closed. Um, I just want to, I don't want to move on before we take an opportunity to ask this question. I just want to, I want to ask if you're here today and, and you've never made that decision to follow Christ and you've never, you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And I, just, just to, for the sake of those around you, just keep your eyes closed. And, and if you're here, if that's you, I just want you to put up your hand. I just want to know if you're here. Just raise it nice and high. Do you want to make that decision? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. You can put it down. Anyone else? You, you want to make that decision. You want to connect yourself to the true vine. Amen. We just pray this prayer, church, with those who are praying that for the first time. Just remain uh, with your eyes closed. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. God, I believe what you said. I believe that you are the bread of life. I believe that you're the light of the world. I believe that you're the good shepherd. And I believe that you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And you rose again on the third day. Father, forgive me for my sin. Lord, help me to walk with you. Help me to follow after you. Give me new life. Give me a new way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, can we just give it up for those who made that decision this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, I want to... I'm going to just close with this and just say thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to have the, the prayer team up after the service. And, and I want to invite you to, if you, if you need prayer for anything, if you just need to, someone to talk to, uh, and I want to invite you to stay after the service and come and get prayed for. Uh, if you made that decision this morning, I want you to tell someone. Tell someone today, if it's if it's someone in the Connect Corner, if it's myself, if it's one of our team, if it's the prayer team, talk to someone. Don't don't let this mo- uh, this moment miss or this moment wash by. Um, and and for the rest of us, I just want to say uh, bless you today on Sunday and just have a great rest of your week. And uh, we love you. Thank you for being with us.